Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, good morning, particularly to those joining from uh, parts of the country and parts of the world that are it's very early. I appreciate uh, uh, getting up and, and, and joining us uh, for this lecture today. Uh, as Annabelle uh, pointed out in, in, in my ra rather wordy bio, <laughs> we, we, we do a fair amount of work here at Novus for our clients at the US Department of Transportation. Uh, we also do uh, work uh, across the entire spectrum of uh, government agencies really with the same kind of role of anticipating uh, the impact of emerging technologies, trying to get in front of that to take uh, advantage uh, of those emerging technologies, whether they be in the civilian and non-civilian space, uh, to sort of transform uh, the way that uh, our, uh, our federal clients go about uh, achieving their mission, achieving the, the goals uh, that they have for, for themselves. And you know, our, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that we have been um, you know, proud partners and members of the of the Moby uh, group. Um, not necessarily since it very got got started, but I think we were in, in the in the first group uh, because we see a ton of um, a ton of transformational capability coming from the application of uh, of blockchain technologies in in a number of arenas. And today, in particular, I'm going to talk about a non civilian, I'm sorry, a civilian application, not a non civilian application, uh, where we think uh, th there's there's fundamental impact from the um, from from moving to a, a paradigm that that uses that leverages the power of blockchain for in a in a use case that is almost um, perfectly suited to its particular strengths um, and so our my our le my lecture today uh, is a bit of a mouthful uh, but it, it relates to some research work that we've done over the past uh, four years or so and development work uh, looking at concepts of earned trust uh, among machines uh, the notion of priority, we'll talk about that. And the sort of blockchain driven multi-machine maneuver transaction uh, as, as being something that's not just interesting uh, as, a, as, a, as a concept, but rather potentially something that also has uh, fundamental implications uh, on the way that we uh, operate roadway systems. I'm gonna stick primarily to roadway systems today, uh, but also how we finance them. And I think, uh, there's been a number of uh, excellent talks in the in the Mobi uh, community uh, around some of these uh, topics. Uh, I thought for today I would I would delve a little bit deeper into some of the some of these fundamentals uh, and why fundamentally uh, we see this opportunity uh, for the multi-machine transaction. All right. So just in case you don't have uh, can't spend all the time with us this morning, I generally do uh, well. What's this talk about uh, in a nutshell? Uh, and so here are the five key takeaway points for um, my, my briefing today. So the, the first is that it's kind of a no brainer, but that when you have uh, multiple autonomous vehicles and they could actually be human driven, in this case, autonomous is sort of a, a broad term I'll define in a minute. Uh, multiple autonomous machines and uh, multiple autonomous vehicles in motion require maneuver decompliction, which is kind of an obvious thing but it's really true you, you can't just expect them to avoid each other uh there has to be some sort of um, systematic way of avoiding collision but if we are going to be serious about deconfliction it, it requires some notion of prioritization even if uh yeah we're, we're only interested in making sure there is no collision the idea that someone goes first and someone goes second and someone goes third is is critical to to deconfliction so you can't do prior you can't do every single system like this needs some sort of prioritization. But realizing priority requires some form of trust among the participants. And, and I would argue preferably earn trust. Let's come back to that in a second. If in fact, we can't trust that the other machines won't follow a set of rules uh, that relate to priority who goes first, then there essentially can be no priority because even if you negotiate it or find a way of identifying priority or, uh, or, or decree that certain kinds of machines in certain situations have certain kind of priority, if there's no trust that that priority will be respected, then you don't have priority, right? And so there has to be some notion of, of trust uh, built into this uh, concept of operations. And we prefer, honestly, earn trust, which is a different kind of trust we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, in which it's not just, uh, well, you should trust this particular machine because it holds a certain certification uh, or it's in a certain position or it's made by a certain manufacturer. 
uh, that that is sort of uh, where you outsource the notion of trust, but rather earned trust is something where based on a track record of performance in previous episodic encounters, the machine has developed uh, a recognizable, quantifiable form of trust, machine trust, that can be inserted into these transactions and, and, the, uh, and the maneuvers built around that. So earned trust essentially is the track record of trust, not a trust assigned by a third party. Uh, fourth is the, the negotiation for priority over shared space reveals value. And I think this is sort of an interesting part of the transaction. It probably is something that's fairly obvious to an audience of this, uh, this group. Uh, but in any case, we're going to talk fundamentally why that's true and what it, what it can reveal uh, about um, priority having value uh, in a trust encoded system. We can reveal essentially a dynamic value of the space in front of us. Uh, and that is a very much a, if you're if you're an econometrician or an economics oriented thinker, uh, you know, when we reveal value, I think there's an important uh, step in the process. Uh, to then figuring out, uh, well, if value is created, then how is value distributed? Uh, value creation is, is, is clearly an economic activity, uh, but value distribution, uh, it can be a very interesting uh, uh, space to work in when you're trying to figure out how to optimize uh, operations, as well as trying to figure out how the system finances itself. So we'll talk a little bit about value generation and then a little bit about um, uh, value distribution. In any case, once we have a good model for value generation, value distribution, then the multi-machine maneuver planning transaction, which encompasses both trust, priority, and the value creation, value distribution problem, it puts us in a position to, to posit a really a different kind of uh, operational and financial paradigm for things like uh, the operational, uh, like roadway systems. So, so that, that's essentially, if, you, if you're not gonna listen to anything more, that, that's the talk. And, and if you're wondering, well, why should I be interested in such pointy headed conversations? Uh, I think that my so what statement is, if we get it right. So if we can design these transactions in such a way that we can ensure uh, priority, uh, that we can accommodate uh, a non-binary form of nuanced trust, and that we, we understand how value is created, we understand how we're distributing it, uh, compared to their current systems, roadway systems, based on the research we're doing, my, my, my so what statement is, uh, compared to right now, we can cut roadway crashes by a factor of 10. We can quadruple system productivity and create a roadway system that pays for itself. And so I think that is a, that, that is the so what statement. Today's uh, lecture, I hate to call it a lecture, uh, I'm going to stick primarily to the fundamentals and not necessarily about the delving into the, the so what statement, but uh, what I'll say is, if we understand these five key points correctly, and if we organize the multi-machine multi maneuver uh, transaction correctly, the, it can have this impact. Um, so, so that's something worth worrying about. It's some, something worth uh, thinking hard about, and it's something uh, worth uh, talking about seriously with, with both our, with our clients, because it does present a transformational uh, concept of how to operate something like a shared uh, roadway system. Okay, so there you go. That's, that's the whole talk. You can, you can sign off, uh, but if you want the details, stay tuned. Uh, I'll talk about each of these a little bit more. Uh, and if there are questions, Annabelle, you can interrupt me. Feel free to, to jot your thoughts into the, the chat box. I don't quite have it open, uh, but I can certainly uh, do so uh, throughout. I'm happy to take questions or uh, uh, dissenting opinions. All right, so as I said, Nobles works with a lot of kind of uh, a broad set of autonomous systems. Uh, the non-civilian space is very different from the civilian space. So I just wanna couch my comments today with respect to a particular kind of uh, decentralized self-organizing autonomous system that we, that we tend to, to study the potential impacts. So in particular, my remarks today regard uh, systems that have the four following key uh, attributes. Number one is that the entities in the system are autonomous. So that is they are capable of some imperfect, potentially imperfect, in, but independent form of sensing and maneuvering. Uh, they could be highly heterogeneous. So you could have large, uh, you know, sort of truck style uh, uh, entities in the system, machines in the system. Uh, they have significant differences in how they maneuver and sense the environment. So uh, homogeneity is, is actually not expected in, in systems like this. 
Uh, the third critical thing is that they are non-adversarial. So uh, the, the point is that these machines are not trying to collide with each other or damage each other. They may have very different intent within the system but using the shared space, but they are not actively trying to, they may be competing with, with the other entities in the system for the space that need to negotiate, but they're not trying to, to harm each other. And that's an important, that's not an important thing. That's not part of the objective uh, for, for the entities in the system. And the third is that there's episodic uh, ad hoc interaction. So that the machines there, there's a very large pool of, of machines uh, that they tend to uh, interact with each other in small groups, uh, but it's unlikely for those, the same three or four machines to be interacting with each other again and again and again in the same space. Um, so this is an important, these are all important things because if, if, if none of these things hold, then really uh, a different kind of, of paradigm for, for control uh, makes some sense. Like for example, a, a factory uh, floor, right? Uh, within within a, a factory floor, there's not really episodic ad hoc interaction. I mean, the, the same collection of population of machines are interacting with each other uh, at the, uh, at a regular uh, at regular time periods, and so the rules we can write for such a system in which they really do see each other all the time, and there's a centralized version of control that can can fit over this. Uh, the, the, the a lot of what I'm talking about probably doesn't apply, but although it seems like a lot of uh, constraints, the good news I suppose is that there are a lot of really good examples of decentralized systems that look like this, and and modern roadway systems are really excellent examples of such organizing systems. In fact, I, I could go on here. I, I won't. There, there are other good examples too. A lot of them taken from the transportation realm, but not not all. But for right today, let's because of the Mobi uh, interest, I'm going to focus uh, specifically on uh, roadway systems, uh, that, which are uh, autonomous, whether human driven or not. The entities in the in the system fit the, this notion of autonomy that I've I've offered up. There's certainly heterogeneity in size, maneuver uh, capability, uh, and weight uh, performance characteristics. It, it is not adversarial. If you drive in the Washington area, you, you may uh, uh, want to dispute that. Uh, or if you if you drive in Boston uh, or, or or Bangkok, I mean there there are there it, some parts of it are adversarial, but it's competitive. But really, the intent is not to collide. <laughs> Despite uh, you know maybe some uh, tempers flaring in, in the system, it, when we're talking about roadway systems, it is not an adversarial system like we talk about in in many of our non-civilian use cases. And, and last, it, it, it really does form, uh, fall into this category of episodic ad hoc interaction. If you think about all of the vehicles in the United States, you have several hundred million vehicles, you know, the, the likelihood that you're gonna see the same uh, vehicle again in uh, repeated interactions is, is pretty small. So the, the pool of, of, uh, of participants is large. Uh, the sets of, of machines that interact with each other in a tactical sense, like at this uh, intersection here, are relatively small, and the the chance that you're going to have repeat encounters and 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 actually see every other machine in the population is is pretty small. Uh, so we need to accommodate for the for the fact that uh, individual machines may not be able to interact directly with every other machine in the population uh, as as we build uh, the a notion of how to f generate a new form of uh, of operational control for the system. All right. So point number one. Uh, now we'll go back to the sort of the, the fundamental components. We will refer to roadway systems uh, throughout here as, as, our, as our touch point for the application. But now I'm gonna sort of abstract the problem here uh, to, to more uh, autonomous machines in general interacting in a system like the ones we've just, just talked about. So it, when you have multiple machines and they have to share a space, that requires maneuver deconfliction. That's primary, primary point number one. So we have to have some form of uh, maneuver deconfliction. So I'm going to use this little example uh, case uh, throughout the rest of my talk as, as a place to sort of think about the how this works together. So consider four autonomous machines, A, B, C, D here on, on the in the space that have to maneuver around a shared space. There are some obstructions there, but they have waypoints. So for example, A is trying to go to waypoint two, so from the top to the bottom. Uh, and that they have, they're not necessarily, they're not in conflict with each other. Uh, they're not trying to crash into each other. They're just trying to essentially get their own uh, way, hit their own waypoints, do their own thing, uh, according to whatever reason why they're in the system and, and make it happen without you know, colliding with uh, the fixed obstructions or each other. So 
machine perception of these obstacles in such a system is not uh, omniscient, right? So we, any one of these machines can only see locally around them uh, and have some notion of what's going on. Uh, and that uh, sensation may be blocked honestly by uh, the obstructions that are in the system. So machine B can build a, a map on its own uh, that says, hey, there's, there's probably a low chance of immediate collision on this path directly across the way uh, versus if I was going to waypoint one directly crossing through the obstruction. But they create these dynamic maps uh, together to, to figure out how to, how to maneuver uh, through, the, through the system. Um, so if they are allowed to communicate, so I'm also gonna talk about, in this case, the notion that the, the machines are not operating in isolation. There's a whole uh, different uh, set of uh, rules that would come into play if, if there was no communication between the system. If they can share the, the path planning, uh, their path plans, then uh, there's two critical things here. One is they can identify ahead of time that there's likely to be any, any conflict. So again, if we are gonna do deconfliction, uh, an important component is, well, well, where are the conflicts? Where are the potential conflicts? And so that's done through unconstrained path planning first. So they first say, well, where would you go if there were no other machines in the system? You can see sort of the, the uh, you know, to the left of the screen, the, the notion of where these machines would potentially make a choice to, to go. Uh, and then we can identify conflict overlap in the cases where the, the machines are passing too close or by each other for, for safety's sake, uh, we can identify, ah, that's a conflict. So we need to, to resolve the use in this case of the center of the square, the center of our space uh, among the, the three machines, A, B, and D. Um, and this, so we, we've, we've at least found now there's, a, there's, there's something to be, we've identified the, the conflict that has to be deconflicted. De so a quick aside on deconfliction. Um, so, Generally, uh, when we try to do deconfliction at any one of the, these spheres, and I, my, my graphic on the, on the right-hand side points out that deconfliction um, depends on use case and depends on domain. So there are actually plenty of use case uh, rule sets for deconfliction that are used uh, you know, by commercial aircraft, uh, by uh, vehicles on the, on the roadway, by uh, ships uh, operating on top of the sea and, and so forth. I mean, we, we have a rich history as, as humans, uh, even in a human-driven environment, of, of coming up with rule sets that, that help to deconflict uh, potential collisions and make the system more predictable. But, but the key thing here is that these rule sets are aligned with the ability of these entities to communicate with each other and sense the system. So humans have very limited ability to uh, to to share information uh, with each other, human drivers in this case, right? So we can do things like use turn signals, but uh, that, that's pretty limited. So but we, but we built the paradigm of deconfliction based on these limitations of human drivers. This includes like striping on the roadways, stop signs, uh, rules like, hey, drive on the right, except for you know, if you're on the parts of the world where you drive on the left, uh, stay within the lanes and, and so forth, right? So all these are essentially common uh, rule sets that help us to, to deconflict uh, collision, uh, deconflict potential collisions in the system based on the limitations of the entities in the system. Okay, but, but the, the, the key thing here is that the autonomous machines, especially the ones that use wireless communications are not like humans. Uh, and so therefore, you know, we can think about doing things differently because they can exchange data regarding situational awareness, intent, and, and do kinds of negotiations that humans are unable to do. I mean, our negotiation capability uh, with using eye contact and shaking fists, uh, honking horns and doing other stuff is super limited uh, in terms of compared to what machines can, can share uh, and information related to all this information about uh, critical to deconfliction. So, so this implies that we could anticipate and avoid, you know, de we can deconflict in, in ways that are completely different than humans uh, in a transaction driven method that don't have to imitate what, uh, what humans do. Uh, and I think this is fairly benign for this group. Uh, I think everybody here would, would agree this is true, but fundamentally, I think it, it offers something specific uh, and valuable. Uh, a transaction, a deconfliction transaction that does not have to align necessarily with the, the way that the humans have done it 
uh, kind of opens up a, a, a new system. And I, I have a I have a different talk about <laughs> about how we got to where we are as as humans collectively and these common rule sets. I mean, they really built up ad hoc. I mean, if we if we if we take a look at, at humans starting with the being uh, uh, drivers of of these kinds of um, uh, automobile technologies, we're only a hundred years, a little over a hundred years into this. Uh, it's figuring it out, and and we we haven't. We didn't start with a plan. We, we started with a notion that uh, was similar to the way we had operated prior to automobility. And uh, we built up a series of ad hoc rules over time to try to mitigate some of the most egregious uh, forms of, uh, of conflict, collision, fatality in the system. We're still today struggling with it, but it was never part of the grand plan to get to where we are. We, we kind of random walked our way to, to where we are as a species in automobility. Um, and the fact that we consistently accept 30,000 deaths a year for the level of efficiency uh, that we have currently is, is really more happenstance than decision. Uh, and so my, the last thing I'll say on this topic before I, until I get back to my regular, uh, regular scheduled program is that you know, we have an opportunity now to do something that isn't just ad hoc, to actually engineer uh, a form of deconfliction uh, uh, for, for this opportunity that may have a very different and positive uh, improvement over our current situation, which, uh, which is this ad hoc situation where we routinely accept uh, 30,000 fatalities in the United States and around the world uh, even more uh, for the level of efficiency and productivity that we get from our, our roadway system. That's a different talk. If you'd like to hear more about that, uh, I, I'm happy to give it, but I'm gonna stick to the script here and move on to key point number two so back to our uh, machines in the in this shared space. Key point number two is that uh, you have to have priority in collective maneuver planning, as I reported before. There there has to be some way of figuring out who goes first. But deconfliction is actually impossible without priority. You you, you have to have it, uh, even if you want to say you have a totally egalitarian system. It doesn't make a difference because you. You have to also divide, a, if, if it's going to be totally equal, if, if, if equity is your number one goal, you still have to determine who goes first. Everyone can't wait for each other. Uh, you know, 100% polite system with no collision is essentially a system with no movement. Uh, because two machines can't occupy the same space at the same time. And if they do, it's likely to be a collision. So in our conflict identified before, here in the center of our, our space between A, B, and D, one machine must have priority and the other two must yield. That must happen. Uh, and priority could be determined in various ways. Uh, you know, we, we could have a strict hierarchical system in which the uh, alphabetic order of the machine's name is the, is the way that we, we do this. We could do it randomly. Uh, there are all sorts of ways. Every one of those decisions actually creates a system uh, with its own uh, set of problems and issues related to um, uh, safety and mobility, but it also uh, creates a, a very uh, complicated rule set to, to make happen. If you think about the collection of rules that we've had to put together to deconflict uh, humans driving, it, it, it's, it's enormous, right? And, and some of it is not even well-defined. And that's why it's very hard uh, if anyone has actually taken on someone who is learning to drive out and tried to explain to them how all the rules of the road work, it's very complicated. It takes some time to, to explain it and even those rules have a ton of ambiguities in them. And by the way, collisions still do happen. Uh, it, it's not, not, a, not a perfect system. So again, I, I'm not gonna delve into all the different ways of doing priority here, but notice that you, you, you must have it. Uh, common rule sets uh, like for human drivers have very uh, lengthy common rule sets to try to make it happen. Um, and that, that, that's, a, that's actually a outgrowth of what humans are like and what they can actually do uh, and perform uh, reliably in, in a system like a roadway. All right, but moving on. So now we talked a little bit before I indicated that priority and trust have this, um, have, they're, they're sort of married. They, 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 or, or beyond that, they're, they're really like uh, electrons and, and protons. They, they, you, you have to have them together to have matter, <laughs> right? You have to have protons, you have to have electrons, and neutrons are good too. But yeah, you know, they may be different things, but you, they, their interaction is the critical thing to sort of chemical interaction, let's say, or, 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 or molecular physics. But, but in this case, what I'm telling you is that trust and priority have a similar kind of connectivity. You can't have priority without trust. And that 
priority in particular is meaningless without trust. Uh, if you don't have it, you can't move forward. So if, if a machine agrees to yield priority, but then simply fails to yield, then collisions are likely to occur. And in such a system, all of our common rule sets, whatever they are, uh, fall apart. Uh, so there has to be some uh, reason to believe that the other machines in the system will be uh, reacting to, as according to the to this common rule sets. Uh, and such systems actually do uh, exist uh, out there, particularly sort of new forms where people are people or machines are trying to figure out new kinds of interactions. Uh, they have to uh, operate exceptionally um, cautiously and ignore all signals of intent generated by other machines. Uh, uh, you know, like bumper cars are actually a pretty good uh, example of this. If, if you've been on a, on a, on a ride there uh, back in the days when people went to carnivals and stuff, there aren't really that many rules in bumper cars, right? Uh, and so, uh, and the intent there actually is to collide. But if you're in a bumper car situation and, you, and, the, and the goal was not to collide with anybody uh, and you got thrown out if you did, there'd be a lot of real slow motion uh, activity uh, in, in such a situation. Um, but such systems with no, essentially no trusted uh, interaction are both unsafe and inefficient. Uh, so real trust is earned. This is my, my last point here is that uh, I'm not going to delve a lot into trust here. I, I have a, another talk. I you think I got like 25 talks. I have another talk on on, on earned trust, particularly. But uh, in a system like this, the kind of trust that we would prefer to have is not one in which a third party declares, "Well, you can always trust uh, a machine from manufacturer X," or we've certified that machine X has a certain, and you can trust them, right? There, there are plenty of systems uh, both in aviation and, and, and actually on the roadway system that, that relate to this. But, um, but in the end, the, the best kind of trust in these sorts of systems in which uh, the, the trust is actually earned and dynamic over time based on the performance of the, of the machines in, in previous or other uh, examples, uh, episodic examples. So the track record of the machine and weighted particularly towards the more recent track record is really the best way of, of uh, maintaining trust. So, so part of our paradigm here should be some method that we can uh, keep a record of how well uh, the machines actually are performing in previous episodic interactions and use that to inform any future collective maneuver planning uh, that, that it engages in in the future. Okay. So now I'm going to leave trust uh, for the moment and talk a little bit about negotiated priority. So there, like I said, there's lots of different ways of doing priority. Uh, the way that we do it now is drivers, we don't, we don't, it doesn't reveal value. Just, you know, if we were at an intersection, stop controlled intersection, it's the general right before left, but who is, who arrived first at the intersection. And then in case of a tie, uh, then the, then whoever is to the right uh, gets to go first. Uh, Rex, uh, four, four legs. It's the same in Germany as it is, 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 is the, as it is in the United States. But that form of priority, though it's you know, relatively efficient, those rule sets, it doesn't do anything about revealing uh, the, the value of, the, of that interaction. I think this is maybe uh, the critical component. So when, you, when we negotiate for priority rather than assign it arbitrarily uh, or according to some external rule set, it reveals uh, value. So let's just assume here for the moment, this gets a bit complicated, so I apologize for the, the complicated diagram. But let's just say that there's a value uh, for every time these machines hit these waypoints, they get a certain units of value. So for this case, machine A gets a big chunk of 32 uh, units of value for reaching waypoint two. Uh, and, and we can do things, and this is what we do with our uh, rovers or, or in our autonomous machines in, in the center here at, at Novalis. Uh, you know, we use sealed bid auctions for very quick to sort of resolve these priorities. So the machines based on this urgency factor or whatever the reward they're gonna get for hitting the waypoints, they, they make a bid. The, the three machines that are in conflict for the center compare those bids. Uh, we take the, the, the winner is the second highest bid plus one unit. Uh, and so now the, the good news is, A, we figured out who has priority. And in this machine it is actually, in this case, it is machine A. But, but machine A kicks into the system eight units of value. And then we also note into the system that the yielding, vehicle, the yielding machines, B and D, are, uh, are get, have yielding value in, both, in, in that round one, round one of the path requests. So, so two things happen. One is we establish, we, we create value, we understand, we, we quantify the value of that dynamic space. And then the second thing is that we keep track of who yielded because they are potentially are entitled to proportion of that value uh, when we do the other critical thing, 
after value generation is value distribution. Okay, so I, I, I will save you from the fact that there are multiple rounds of negotiation similar to what I just showed you results in a collective maneuver plan. So in this case, we let the machines do their thing uh, in an Carl, we lost you. Carl, we can't hear you. Can you hear us? Carl, I think we lost you. You might have lost connection. Oh, sorry, right. Annabelle, I was talking. To, I don't know how long. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. We lost you for about the past 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Well, better 30 seconds than 30 minutes. Okay. Um, we'll <laughs> go from, I'll take that as the, all right. So I'll just come back real quick here yep, to right the, yep. the, the multiple rounds of priority. Uh, what, what I'll just say quickly is that the it's a complex negotiation. Once we, it, it's a complex negotiation that, that reveals value, uh, which is critical, establishes priority, and I'll talk about a minute also it relates to so trust here and I'll, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But, the, but if this plan is then executed, then the machines will have successfully success, self uh, organized to do three critical things at the same time. Number one, they deconflict themselves, which ensures safety or improve safety. That it maximizes the value of motion uh, by improving efficiency. Everyone understands the intent and has, and has a plan where priority is uh, clearly identified. And it, it, it's done this third thing, which is to quantify the value of the dynamic space. And, and last we talk about um, value uh, distribution, it can do have very interesting effects on what the system uh, is positioned to do uh, in the future and how it's financed. But for right now, I wanna say, okay, well that you just assumed Carl here that the plan is executed properly. What if it's not executed properly? And I think that is the critical connection for blockchain, right? So number one, it's a complex, uh, it's a relatively complex multi-machine uh, transaction. It has to ha happen very quickly. Uh, and so the multi-machine transactions can enable this new full ecosystem financial paradigm if it includes all the attributes we just talked about. Did it, can it guarantee, does it establish priority? Does it take into account trust? And does it do value generation? And the answer we think with our uh, orchestrated autonomy concept, which you, some of you may have seen before as pieces of eight, and we've entered this in, in a number of the rounds of the grand challenge with, with Moby uh, to good effect, is that yes, we think we, we formed a, a concept of how to do that for this um, kind of use case, like around the, the roadway system. So uh, I won't give a ton of information on this uh, chart because I briefed it before in this venue a couple of times, but what I'll say is the machines themselves make transactions, but they also serve as verifiers of other machines when the, ex when the plan is put into action. If, for example, in this case, the yellow car, the yellow drone sees the blue truck go off uh, route, right? If it, if it varies from the plan, it can be essentially reported. And if it's egregious enough, the whole uh, transaction will be nullified. And so there are consequences in a smart contracting sort of parenthetical system, blockchain system, to violating the, the plan, uh, which is very interesting. But in any case, one of those things that happens is a reduction in the trust score for that machine in further uh, episodic transactions after this, right? So if the blue truck suddenly starts swerving around, is not acting like it had been in the past, it cannot be trusted to do maneuver planning or share sensory information like it had previously, such things could be noted in our blockchain as part of the transactions. And critically, the, the same blockchain consortium that handles these things deliver trust reports, essentially that, that track record into all future transactions. So this ecosystem uh, combines both this notion of trust with the notion of uh, emergent value identification with the notion of clear prioritization. Uh, so that that is all awesome. And, and I think we, we can demonstrate this in physical systems. We have big simulations that, that, that do this. Uh, there are all sorts of very interesting tweaks. Uh, and the, the critical thing I'll say here is 
how you decide to do various things like manage trust and, and deal with value are all, are all super important to, to making it work right. But it, you can write your own rule sets that are very much different than the human inherit, the legacy human inherited rule sets about how value is generated, how value is distributed. And I think that for today is maybe the most critical, <laughs> critical component. And the interaction between operations like the operational efficiency, safety, and finance can actually be brought together as one piece of many, many transactions uh, all happening throughout, throughout the system. So to talk briefly about that, so considerations related to value distribution. So, so if we have an ecosystem like that generating value, now comes an interesting question. You know, so I didn't say like all of the value generated by a, a vehicle getting priority goes to the vehicles who yield. That's one, that's one mechanism that you could do. Uh, but in general, our approach is if you're trying to build a self-sustaining uh, piece of shared infrastructure or an ecosystem in this case, then it probably should, you probably should be thinking about all of the entities that contribute to that value generation. It's not just that the yielding vehicles are the only ones that are there. I mean, if there was no road, there's no value. If there were no uh, potentially roadside information facilitating uh, communication, or facilitating uh, the identification of obstacles like pedestrians in and around the intersection, then maybe you never could have uh, come to a, a reasonable uh, a, a maneuver plan or a very different kind of highly cautious plan, right? So, so this notion is that value distribution, honestly, we think, and this is you know, from the government side in particular, looking at the whole system, should account for all the parties that, that facilitate that value generation. Machines that include machines that yield priority, entities that provide and maintain the maneuver space, the roads, entities that provide maneuver and sensor verification reports. So maybe there's also infrastructure on the side of the road that also checks to see whether or not the vehicles executed according to plan. Entities that provide reliable obstacle sensor data or more accurate uh, position and timing data. So we've certainly seen some interesting results related to the value of infrastructure placement in and around uh, locations where there, it's very difficult to maneuver or line of sight for sensors uh, don't work well uh, or conditions percent pretty like low visibility in which uh, like a supporting set of infrared sensor systems can be crucial, right? To, to making sure that the, that the machines can move without colliding with each other at relatively high speeds. And then finally, the sort of the, the ecosystem that provides and inserts the trust reports, the blockchain related activities in this case, the stuff that we think really is a, a natural application for blockchain uh, is, are all parts of this ecosystem. And so that value generation, and I'll go back here just real quick. We generated eight here for, as an example. Um, one of the reasons we call this the pieces of eight system is that when we generate value, that's great. But how we chop up that coin, if you know anything, if, you, if you're familiar with the pieces of eight as a, a big silver doubloon from the Spanish uh, era uh, in the 1500s, 1600s, uh, 1700s, and in fact, colonial America was driven primarily by chopping up uh, microtransactions or small transactions between uh, farmers and so forth in the, in the colonies uh, in the United States were driven primarily by taking these big Spanish coins and chopping them up into eight pieces because they had marks on them that would allow that to equally be uh, easily be chopped up because the, the, the balloon itself was too large a value to really be useful for day-to-day -day, uh, transactions. But if you chop them up, then you could actually uh, do something useful and, and, and identify and, and, and facilitate trade for things like, you know, chickens and bales of hay, and I don't know, whatever else, uh, mugs. I don't know, you know, now you get me. I don't really know what they're trading in, in colonial times, but you get the idea. Something that, that, is, that a king wouldn't buy, but that regular people would do. In this case, this notion is that we can take the that value that we generate, that and we can chop it up and divide it among the entities in the system. Uh, we have all sorts of interesting ideas about how to do this as well, but simply one way of doing it is, is that we use sometimes an example, is to ha take half the coin and give it to the machines that yield priority, and the other half divide into four pieces which relate to the entities, the roadside infrastructure, and the maintenance of the roadway itself. Uh, and essentially everybody gets a piece of the eight, right? A piece of this big Spanish doubloon or this value generation as a way, as, a, as I say, simple notion of how to do it. Because in, in this case, we really uh, uh, have generated value, but now we've made a collective decision to distribute the value in ways that rewards or uh, compensates the, the fact that it's not free to do any of these uh, items here on the, on the list I've provided. So, uh, so my, here's a slide about 
what does it mean for roadway system and finance? So currently, as you probably all know, uh, we, we finance our roads based on legacy fuel tax driven models, which are completely falling apart. Uh, they, the, the fuel consumption is down. Electric vehicles don't use gas. <laughs> there is no over the road uh, user fee on, on uh, and road user fees and, and then except for uh, toll roads and so forth. Uh, and these trends, these problems in terms of shortfalls continue to, um, to expect to, to grow over time. So, so we're not saying necessarily that, this, uh, that what we provided in the pieces of aid solves every one of those problems. That, that's, that's too facile. But what I will say is that a machine centric method of collective maneuver planning and, and the simultaneous identification of linking operation, system revenue generation, value generation, value distribution is an excellent way to start a conversation about how to uh, align those things in ways that we never had before with the human paradigm, that we can use this notion of autonomy and blockchain and other, these other technologies to create a new model for, for finance that can replace the, the, our current models uh, with a bunch of really great other uh, side effects like really improving the safety of the system as well as the, the productivity because, and people say, well, why is it improved productivity? And we've done this again with some of our estimates of it with some of our rover work uh, in our lab as well as in the simulation. And the reason is because uh, humans have significant limitations about how they can maneuver. Uh, machines uh, can do a much better job. They can get much closer to each other. They can go side to side. And, and the other critical thing is that uh, you can take away the, the sort of rigid idea that, you know, we, for example, the three lanes of, the, uh, of a bridge northbound are always uh, uh, set for northbound travel and three lanes are set for southbound. Uh, it, it allows the machine, so if you have a system like this, the maneuver plans can dynamically adapt to whatever the demand is. Uh, and so if in fact we do need six lanes outbound at some point, say for an evacuation or five lanes or 3.7 lanes, whatever else, we can dynamically allocate them to, to maximize the efficiency and, and the overall multiplier we think uh, based on our early research is around four times in terms of overall system productivity. So, so that essentially is the, again, back to the, to the so what, but it's built on um, this notion of getting the transactions right. If we can build the transactions correctly, we can have all these uh, benefits. If we build the transactions uh, just to mimic the way that we do it now in the human uh, centric system, then we essentially will end up right back where we were, or maybe just a slight improvement over what we currently have, which is a system that is, you know, hopefully it's a little bit safer. So I think that that's great, uh, but maybe no more uh, efficient than it was. And certainly we still will be arguing over who pays uh, for, for such a system. And, and I think the, the arguing over who pays is, is to some degree, some of the critical uh, issues. Uh, if, if we do need infrastructure on the roadway, I mean, we do need roadways, right? We need, if we do need infrastructure on the side of the road to, to support um, I think to, to really support the, the dream of uh, you know, highly autonomous machines working in the system together, uh, these sorts of transactions, correct, uh, you know, really well-designed planned transactions gives us this opportunity. And I think with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop Annabelle and hopefully my mic is still on and I have been talking uh, on mute for the last 15 minutes. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, Carl, I do have a question from Ben Town. Are you ready for it? Or do you need a little bit more time to finish up the presentation? No, no, I'm done. That, that, I, I've, I have no more prepared remarks. So people should feel free to ask questions. Uh, you know, give me a counterpoint. I'm, I'm happy to engage. All right, let's go. Um, from Ben Town, is mileage or some loose variation thereof, for example, mileage above, below a certain speed, a reasonable proxy for earned trust. There seems to be some survivorship bias that if a vehicle did not yield after agreeing to do so, it would be less likely to continue to be roadworthy. Uh, wow, so it's, an excellent, it's an excellent question. So, so yes, uh, I think there are all sorts of proxies, right? So, so that is, that's absolutely true. Um, and we, we have some of those kinds of proxies in our, in our current system. Uh, like for example, uh, for trust, well, one one uh, example of a proxy in the system is that people put student driver magnets on their car when they're helping a their their kid or or new driver learn, and and it's a signal to everybody in the environment to in the ecosystem to give this uh, machine give this vehicle being driven by the uh, this new driver 
uh, you know, more leeway, right? So, so if, I mean, if you're, if you're like me and you see a student driver magnet on a car, you say, all right, expect the unexpected because this, this uh, particular driver may turn right from the left lane they may straddle the <laughs> the dotted line. They 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 will they will maybe deviate from the rule set. Okay, so so that that's one particular form of of uh, trust signaling in our current system. So so it's imperfect for sure. Uh, it's approximation, but and do, do, I, I haven't actually seen the statistics. I'm not, I don't know. It'd be an interesting point if anybody knows whether or not the 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 use of student driver magnets uh, or rookie driver magnets on cars have actually reduced the number of crashes involving rookie cars, but you get the intent there, which is to, to share trust. Now, is there another form of trust somewhere in between that we can discern by aggregate? And so I think insurance companies do this a lot, right? By looking at how much uh, vehicles can travel before time, time between collision for any particular driver, right? So that, that's an example, and maybe that gets to your point, uh, Ben, uh, related to, uh, yes, we, we, we do try to do some even more nuanced uh, notions of what is trust through, our in, through driver insurance currently, right? By saying, all right, well, this person, uh, this driver tends to, I don't know, I'm gonna get on a limb here, get drunk a lot, crash a lot, whatever. So they have to pay a higher premium. So the system is trying to, to signal the system that they uh, that they are paying a penalty for entering in the system, even though they're not as trusted an entity, but it's at a very aggregate level. And 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 further, if they're if they're so terrible, if they're unsafe uh, in in, in, a, in an egregious way, they can have their driver's license uh, revoked and then be essentially removed from the system, uh, uh, which I think is is a useful notion of of, of trust in our, in our current. So so your notion of can sort of roadworthiness, uh, amount of time, time between collisions or time between conflict uh, be a surrogate for trust? And I think the answer is yes, it, but I think it's all part of the spectrum going essentially from uh, something as simple as the, uh, as the student driver magnet all the way over to what I'm talking about here, uh, because I think the, the way the machines can really uh, talk about and construct uh, uh, detailed trust reports it relates to centimeter level uh, resolution on maneuver capability, right? So that, that's what we deal with with our, our machines in our lab. We, 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 we trust them uh, based on how much, but at, at centimeter level uh, differences about whether they can follow a path, uh, how much they can, how fast they can go and maintain uh, adherence to a, a path that includes not only the width of the vehicle uh, of the machine, but also the the buffer space uh, around it that is uh, that is required for for it to, to maneuver. So, it's it's a matter it's a matter of, of resolution and granularity. Uh, so I think absolutely you're 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 thinking about a very interesting way of doing it. That's an improvement on our current system, uh, but it but it kind of pales in comparison to the kind of precision that we can get from uh, a pure machine system. And 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 I will also absolutely admit that you can't leap directly into everything being all machines. It has to be something also in the middle where there are humans. Uh, so there are, we need to explore that middle ground too, to establish what, what that means. And actually that's another uh, part of our research program here at, at Noblis, um, looking at sort of uh, mixed human and machine systems and a shared notion of uh, trust based on performance and repeated encounters. It actually is, uh, it is quite amenable to, to the way that the humans and the machines build up trust, but what it means and how it's actualized for machines and, and humans are or must be related and commensurate with the ability of the particular thing, either the machine or the human, to interpret those signals and react in the system. So Ben, you asked an excellent question and I've given you a, maybe a very long answer to, to some different kind of question, but hopefully that, that is roughly in the range of your question. Thank you. I have more questions for you. Okay. Blockchain has the problem of a low speed and high energy consumption. How will blockchain be able to deal with all the transactions? All low right. Yeah. So yeah, we get this one. Yeah, we get the, this one a lot. Um, and I think we we solved it uh, the best we can for uh, practical purposes. So there there are two things. I'm gonna go back a, a slide here. I actually just found the chat pod so I can look at these myself. Um, but uh, here. Um, so what we do is we divide the world up into the fast moving space, which is essentially this collective maneuver planning space among the machines in proximity to each other within inside this proximity boundary. Uh, 
And then the slow moving space out here relates to the management of the of the trust. Because you're exactly right. If 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 blockchain is out here, uh, if we had to wait for blockchain, uh, depending on the type of blockchain you use and the proof of blank to to do it, uh, it it's just too slow. So the collective maneuver space uh, here must be very quick. We we do all this in about a tenth of a second with our current uh, generation of of machines in our lab. So they do the whole thing: uh, negotiation, transaction formation, uh, maneuver planning, uh, and then they and then they execute against that. It takes about a tenth of a second to do all that. Uh, it's it's very quick. Uh, but what we do is we have a separate set of uh, servers on the outside that manage these reports as the transactions come in. So it not it doesn't happen in real time. So so if in fact the blue truck has done something that has proven itself to be untrustworthy, it doesn't get fed back into the system until the slow moving space catches up with the uh, with the fast moving space. And for our lab examples, that's probably a 10 to 15 minute delay. Uh, what would be at scale for a roadway system like the United States, uh, I, I don't have a, a good estimate for yet. But the critical thing is to engage the blockchain in the slow moving space that relates to feeding the, you know, to, to uh, managing this value distribution issue, as well as managing the, the trust reports, which then are inserted back into the fast, the multiple fast moving spaces out in the, uh, out in the system. So it, it's, uh, you could do this all without blockchain. But the, but the notion is that we believe blockchain is perfect because for this application, given the, the nature of the decentralized interaction among the entities and the fact that it's a comp relatively complex transaction that requires verification, all that can be built into something relatively simply in a blockchain situation. It could also be done without blockchain, but uh, the, the security of the blockchain and the multiple eyes on the, on the, on the, uh, on the blockchain itself in our consortium model helps to, to make it happen. But speed, I think, I think we kind of figured it out. Um, I have a, another a follow-up question sure. from the, the same person. How does one need to redesign roadways to allow for this kind of passing behavior? How does that impact pedestrians, cyclists, et cetera? Outside of the V2I four-way stop and low traffic, how would this even manifest? Right, so, so great, great question. So, Honestly, that what we find, uh, well, okay, let, let, let's go from like sort of how we evolve from where we are to something different in the future, right? So for right now and for the near future, we absolutely retain striping, signals, all that kind of stuff. The lots of humans in the system. So we need to, to deal with that. Um, but I don't think we need to uh, be beholden to those forever. And in fact, I am a little bit uh, concerned about uh, notions of, of automated driving that, that strictly adhere to or mimic human driving as the endpoint for for system interaction because again it just leaves us in the same ad hoc collective position we were had developed over the last 120 years as a species within automobility now so for merge control uh, merge weave operations for seven legged operations any sort of at grade intersection anytime that there is interaction among machines uh, we could begin to think about doing it differently. So, for example, uh, some machines may be able to split lanes in ways that are different, or three vehicles could split two lanes. Uh, in this case, if they were able to have enough uh, uh, capability to, to do so, or use the shoulders, I guess that's the other critical thing. So we could start having shoulder use. Uh, we could also reserve uh, at parts of that for pedestrians or cyclists if needed. Uh, Pedestrians or cyclists could be part of the um, could be part of the interaction. Of course, we'd have to structure the interaction in ways that are understandable to the to the humans who are in those situations. Uh, so there's there's a ton of different things to do. And in the and in the end, I think the the critical thing I'll say is that rather than sort of drag on too long, I think we get to a point at some point where a lot of the a lot of the human legacy striping and other control devices in the system are still there, but they may be overridden by the, uh, the machines themselves. So, so that it may not be that a red light means a red light for the, that machine. If in fact, there are no humans around, it's kind of like the, if, you, if, if somebody, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to, to hear it, it doesn't make a sound. So if there's a red light and, and there's no human drivers, does the red light actually mean anything? And the answer is probably not. Uh, in this case, the machines could collectively plan around a maneuver that doesn't include 
consideration of the red light because it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's not, I mean, it's not meaningful to that paradigm. So, so in any case, I think we can start talking about moving to a, uh, moving to a transaction that retains all that human legacy stuff, but then incrementally begins to say, well, when we have collections of machines that uh, negotiate without, they can do so without necessarily beholding to every one of those common rule sets that we've built for the, for the human driver. And again, another long-winded answer, but hopefully I think in the, in the range of uh, answering the question you asked. Thanks, Carl. Your parting thoughts on the best place to go to read more about these topics, white papers, studies, et cetera. Um, sure. Well, uh, I, I guess I'll put in a plug for for the for our Noblest site for orchestrated autonomy. If you put in uh, plug, if you search for Noblest orchestrated autonomy, you can actually see a white paper from us on this, a couple of white papers from us on this topic, as well as a, a larger compendium about the Noblest worldview about autonomy at scale. So beyond just the uh, sort of civilian roadway use case here. Uh, but essentially, uh, back to that the graphic I showed before, where we, it starts with the uh, the subs uh, uh, automated subs searching the bottom of the seafloor uh, all the way out to um, uh, sort of aerospace and extraterrestrial operations. So I, I think uh, if you're interested, uh, those are uh, those are a great place to 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 go uh, for right now. And uh, I'm Moby itself, of course, and all of its um, uh, all of its uh, uh, the stuff that that Annabelle. Uh, and, and Chris and all our friends at Moby put together are, of course, another excellent uh, place to go. And with that, with those two plugs, I throw it back to you, Annabelle. Hopefully that <laughs> uh, that 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 earned uh, earned something. Well, oh yeah, and actually, my my colleague uh, Drew Dudash has just posted a link in the chat box related to where you can pull uh, at least the autonomy at scale materials, uh, and they're the orchestrated autonomy oh, one perfect. as well. Terrific. Thanks, Andrew. And thank you, Carl, so much for speaking to our audience and answering these questions. I fully support highly autonomous machines, less fist shaking and emotions on the road. Uh, as mentioned, the recording will be posted up on our website, dlt.mobi, in the coming week. Until then, take care and stay healthy, everyone. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>